All right. Welcome, everybody. My name is Mark Stabina, a.k.a. the Yog Father. And this is Yog Talks number four. Yeah. So um, who's happy that the World Cup's over? I am... We're going to talk about it right now. It's never too soon when there's, a, when there's a Brit that bombed out. I'm just glad we get to go back to work now. Congratulations to the French. Any Frenchies in here? Frenchies? Half? Good. I can talk shit about them then. The worst thing about the French winning is that now they have an excuse to be even more arrogant. I don't know if you know any French people. Speaking for the non-winners, those that represent a come from a country that uh, didn't win the World Cup, like Australia, or, or I'm assuming that actually were in the World Cup. <laughs> Sorry, Americans. <laughs> and that's too soon. That's too soon. Yeah. So speaking for the non-French, the, non the, the non-Americans, um, and the non-Italians, actually. Italy weren't even in the World Cup. Uh, let me just say, what a stupid time zone to hold a World Cup when you live in America. 3 a.m., those pool matches were brutal. 3 a.m., 5 a.m., it really tested the uh, patriotism. I found out through the World Cup what a shitty Australian I was. I actually watched <laughs> one game ro with Robbie uh, at the Cock and Bull, and that was about it. It was, uh, it was a lot of fun, but just want to thank every single one of you. It's warm. It's a Wednesday night in LA. There's a lot going on and you chose to be here. So thank you so much. Give yourselves a round of applause now as we hype it up, going into Yog Talks. And number three. Four. Wow. Already it's hot. Make sure you're well hydrated. So we've got a bumper night for you, some amazing guests, and uh, we're going to go through the normal format with, I want to shine a light on a couple of yogs. We actually have a yog couple in the house. We're going to hear from them and what they're up to in the community. Awesome, Robbie. And now we just got to figure out how to get that going. Just point it at me, thanks. And, uh, and two amazing uh, panel speakers as well. Uh, I'll introduce them a little later on. But what I want to do is um, acknowledge our sponsors. So we're going to show a little clip here, and I'm just going to go through some of the sponsors. We have a couple, and obviously Fabric Studios is where we're sitting. Wonderful space. And that was quick. <laughs> so if you can go back to GT's, you're all drinking GT's kombucha. And there's a new flavor out. I believe it's called Unity, which is perfect, because that is what I am aiming to achieve with this little community, is bringing everyone together and they actually have a video they've just released. Sent a text when you made it home. Only made me feel more alone. I'm still all about you. But you don't, you don't Wanna be the first to make a move GTs, they've been wonderful. They've been supporting Yog Talk since the second one and, and continue to support. Carver as well. Uh, we have one of our speakers tonight is very high up in Carver and arranged this sponsorship. You notice the, the dip, the Peters and the dips. So that was a nice little addition. Thank you, Carver. I don't know if you've ever gone and had a salad there. There's two locations now in, uh, on the west side. There's one on Lincoln. Four. There's four. I feel <laughs> sorry, Carver. Wow, you're just growing so quickly. And uh, the next sponsor is not actually a sponsor, but we have a video. So before we press play on this, um, 
I've been getting up and explaining, and I will continue to explain what YOG is. A lot of you have walked in not knowing what the hell it is, to be expected. So the aim is to get some clarity over what young, older guy really is and the concept behind it. So I made a little video that will explain it, and then I don't have to bumble my way through the explanation. So when you're ready. So you're probably wondering what a YOG is and where the concept came from. Well, it all started with two best mates and roommates at the time, one of them South African, even though he has an Australian name. That's him, Bruce. Don't let the charming photo fool you. He can actually be a bit of a caveman sometimes. And that's the other guy, Mark, AKA me. I actually am Australian, if you haven't figured out already. And if you're American, you probably haven't figured it out already. I'm Australian. Anyway, we love to travel. And on one trip back in 2012, we went to China and then we went on to Australia. We actually went to one of the local bars with a drinking age is not 21, but 18. And we felt a little bit out of place. It was as if all the young people in there were viewing us the same way they would view their dad's mate. Suddenly, we felt like those older guys that sit in the corner of the bar. So we had a bit of a cry about it, but then it was okay. We started consoling each other for being the older guys because Let's face it, we still felt young, both in body and spirit, and wait a minute, something clicked. If we're now the older guys, and we feel young, we're young older guys. Well, we just stumbled across a world-changing concept, and this is how Yog was born. Anyway, back to that same trip. We couldn't stop talking about it the entire time. We're like, we got to get this Yog concept out there. We've got to send the message. We've got to inspire other men. We've got to start a movement. But how old is a yog? Let's establish that first. Yeah, that sounds about right. We figure that's about the age when boys become men. Oh, and it turns out to be the minimum age that you can be if you want to run for the President of the United States. So how do we inspire men over 35 to live a healthy, balanced, fulfilling life of no regrets? Well, that's easy. We start a blog and we call it the Yog Blog. We can share videos and post articles using our expertise. Did I mention Bruce was a holistic doctor? He's really bloody good, you should see him. And this video is proof. You gotta tell you exactly what's wrong with his back. I got a stuffed back. Okay. So you see how far you can go that way? Yeah. My nerve in my leg, left leg was killing me. It's gone, totally gone. That video kills me. But seriously, make an appointment with Bruce ASAP. And then there's me. I can share my knowledge on my personal training. So you can start with a nice low impact warm up like this one on the stair climber. Yep, standard, which is okay, because that's one of the main attributes of being a yog, not taking yourself too seriously, having a laugh, bringing the joy, being outrageous, dressing up, not caring what people think about you. It's about being your best self and being bigger than your circumstances. And being a yog isn't about being a bachelor and chasing young women all the time. No, yogs come in all shapes and sizes, like Gary. Gary's a successful businessman. He's happily married. He's got kids. He gives back to the community. He is a yog. Thanks for coming tonight, by the way, Gary. And the idea behind YOG is to build a community of impactful men and women who are up to big things and inspire each other to live out our vision and give back to the community. Because after all, when we give, we receive. And when we make a difference, that's when we leave a meaningful legacy. Without this crucial ingredient, you can never truly live the YOG's life. Hopefully, again, we're going to get this right one day. Uh, that wasn't loud enough for you to really hear and, 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 understand and get all my jokes. But um, the next time you come, Yog Talks number five, it's going to be perfect. And I'll throw some little surprises in. So let's move right along. The Yog couple, we have them here in the flesh. These are two uh, dear friends of mine who are up to great things in the community. They both live in Venice. And... Uh, we have, stand up guys, come and, uh, come and take the stage. We have Nicole Landers, she's going to be the first one here. And Michael, be careful, one of those wobbles. So I'll get you to, so we're going to just uh, go through their uh, video one by one. You'll see what um, Nicole's up to. And they're just going to quickly explain what they're doing in the community to inspire the rest of us and, and also inspire support from us. As will Michael, he has uh, some great events like this as well. That I've been to a few of them and they're fantastic and I urge all of you to go. So, <laughs> press play, Annie, and you'll see what Nicole's up to.
wonderful thing uh, to see the community come together Finally. and to meet some of the neighbors that we oh. don't know. I'm ready to fly, spread my wings, I'm on my way. Not afraid of that sky, let the wind carry me. Drifting and dancing, cut off all my strings, see the eyes of the storm. My name is Seppi, and I work with the Dharma Kitchen. We are collaborating with Community Healing Gardens Over there. to start some cooking workshops here at the Verde Davis Center. I'm ready to fly. The one thing that binds every man, woman, and child on the planet together is food. And it's the one thing that we all work together to uh, be a part of, can change the relationship dynamic and just how we connect with people. Trying to get people to uh, consciously uh, develop their own homes and grow their own food. And that uh, lifestyle, that idea is what we need to bring back because it's the only way we're really going to be able to know our neighbors, engage our community, and all support each other. That I learned to love Smiling faces I feel peace in the places That I fly One second guys, hang on <laughs> He's doing Thank a GT you. moment Okay, Nicole, take it away Couple of minutes, let us know uh, What is next for the Community Healing Gardens First off, thank you for inviting me to YOG. I, I think what you're doing is great, and um, bringing like-minded people together to share and be inspired is so important. We can get so lost, and I was talking to a friend that's here, and, and it's like, you know, we get up in the morning and we do our lives, and then we look around, and what do we have? And there's stuff, there's a bank account, there may be some friends, some family, but what do we really have? Like, what, what are you leaving? What's your legacy? Like, what are you here to do? And it, it took me a long time to find that, what I was here to do. And then in the middle of finding what to do, I got burnt out in the middle of doing this. So I'm gonna be honest, like where I'm at with my vulnerability and my realness about giving back and being of service and what does that look like? And then how do you find your way back to what the purpose was in the first place of why you wanted to do something that made a big impact in your community? So, I live in Venice for over eight years. How many of you live in Venice? Okay, and how many of you have seen the garden boxes on the streets? Okay, so this was um, a social experiment that a group of friends and local business owners and uh, men and women who have lived in Venice for decades put together. And we saw that we wanted to do something to shake up the community. And in 2015, there were a series of unfortunate um, happenings with violence and guns, nothing new to Venice, but just all happened in like a three month time span to where a mutual friend of ours saw somebody get shot in the head in broad daylight and died instantly and it was uh, a gang retaliation. And so we sat around and talked about like, how do we change the community? How do we bridge the divide? We have a lot of new people moving in. We have a lot of companies, a lot of change, a lot more money. How do we get people talking and really understanding one another? And we all thought about this. And as we're sitting in my friend's backyard eating food, we realized there was one thing that bound us together, and that was food. So how do we create that so that everybody can feel a part of it put their hands in the earth and, and feel that consciousness and be able to talk to one another and relate on the same page where there's no boundaries, there's no gate, there's no membership, there's no charge. And that hence, this is what started. We, we popped up these garden boxes on the sidewalk and we didn't ask permission and we, we, we didn't do anything wrong, but we didn't ask. So we didn't ask the city, we didn't do anything like that. We just made sure they were in red zones, we made sure the city streets were wide enough and we just put up 80 of these garden boxes. And then all of these things started happening and then we started a nonprofit. Um, but there were a lot of challenges and there's a lot of challenge for doing that. So far we have affected though over uh, 300 children in the community of Venice and the out outskirts of Venice. We have a robust after school program at the Oakwood Rec, Rec Center which was once a drug 
and gang riddled park, which is now used by many people for many reasons. Some of you may play kickball there. Anybody play kickball there or softball or anything like that? Yeah, so it's, it's widely used. Um, and that's been a great program. And we also work with the St. Joseph Center. Uh, and you guys know of the St. Joseph Center. They're a 40-year-old nonprofit that helps men and women get back into life and get them off the streets. And we work with their culinary program. And so what we've realized is that not only did we outstretch to our community, we've outstretched within the community to other organizations that are like-minded, and then we started attracting businesses that were like-minded and getting support. But then it wasn't enough. And so you have to constantly think, think about, like, what does that really look like, and how is it sustainable? So we started to think about how we could be more sustainable. And I was able to step back, to step forward, and really see what can I do. So I took it a step further with my team, and I started reaching out for more help from the city, from businesses, and we're getting there. We just got acknowledged by LA Park and Rec, and we're going to be doing an after-school program with them. They're going to help us financially. We've gotten a lot more businesses and people like yourselves to step up because this will not sustain if we all don't put something in the bank. So it's like having a bank account and constantly withdrawing, right? And what happens? There's nothing in the bank account. <laughs> so we constantly have to regroup and retool and rework. Why, is, why are we doing this? What's the purpose? Why do people want to get involved? So how many of you volunteer for this? OK, great. How many of you gardened? How many of you want to garden? Great. So we have our next, next volunteer day on August 19th in Venice. And we meet up at the Oakwood Rec Center on California and 7th. I can share more about it. Um, we have a really good time. We have a really good party atmosphere. We have all walks of life that come. We don't turn anybody away. And you get to take home food or pay it forward. Give it to a neighbor, give it to a friend, give it to somebody on your street. We've grown over 3,000 pounds of food in Venice. We've um, served hundreds of men and women food at Bread and Roses with our food, uh, which is a work experience kitchen that the St. Joseph Center runs and feeds 100 men and women a day, Monday through Friday. And I think what's happened is that more and more people are now getting involved again in our community because they want to meet their neighbors. They want to meet new friends, and they want to get out there. So we've actually made a lot of connections for people, love connections, business connections. <laughs> it's kind of interesting what's happened. So I feel really blessed that I got to help create it. Um, it doesn't run by me. It runs by the we. And that shifts and ebb and flow depending on who's involved. Michael's seen it go up and down, and, and he's been a big support of what we're building. And I'm just really grateful to be able to share it with all of you. So thank our Instagram you. is at Community Healing Gardens. And that's our web address. So thank you so much. Thank you, Nicole. Please give a round of applause. Thank you. 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 Without any further ado, the other half of the odd couple, this guy, let's have a little look, uh, Annie, shall we, at what Michael's doing. I'm ready to fly. I'm ready to fly. I'm ready to fly. And that was Clayton Joseph Scott with Ready to Fly. And if you're ready to fly, you're in the right place. Welcome to Travel Talk. Have you experienced something special traveling? Something that's left you moved, touched, and inspired? That's what travel with meaning is. Meet my friend, Mike Scheibel. Travel has always been a part of my life. My parents introduced my brother and me to new places and new experiences as young kids. Traveling to Europe after high school, I had the travel bug, which led me to study and work abroad. All of these experiences would lead me to want to learn, see, and do more. And then a few years ago, I sold everything I had. I bought a one-way ticket to Australia and spent almost a year on the road, seeing incredible places, having unforgettable adventures, meeting and interviewing amazing people from all over the world. Working conditions are generally pretty good. There's no point just sitting on your ass all day. You might as well just get out, do what you want to do. 
travel makes the world and the life experience much more rich. Not only keeps me young. Gives me something to do, gives me a purpose. Being in these crazy places is like letting it kind of affect Tour guide Dingo Dave over here. Never done an email. People seem to be less guarded, more authentic when they're traveling. Each video, each picture, each moment, and every interaction was meaningful in its own way. I was able to appreciate the true magic of travel. This led me to launch Travel With Meaning to encourage you to have and share your own unique travel experiences and remind you to be present to the awesomeness of your journey. Join our growing community by sharing moments that move, touch, and inspire you while traveling by using hashtag travel with meaning. Everybody, Mike Scheibel. <laughs> Just let us know when the next one is, Mike, and... Um, yeah, on the screen right here, so, so um, as you can see, that was the, that's the open video that we have for each travel talk. So we do these travel talks um, monthly, every other month, bringing together like-minded travelers to hear stories from different professionals, entertainers, entrepreneurs, CEOs, who've really been impacted by travel, things that have really changed their life, their career. Um, and we do fireside chat with these people and hear stories um, to, hear s to hear what they've been up to. So we're doing the next one August 14th uh, at Control Collective in Playa Vista. We got two really, really different and amazing travelers. I like to use somebody who's in the travel industry. Uh, Sarah has a website called Ask the Concierge, and she's actually a very well-known, world-renowned concierge. She currently works at the London West Hollywood. And then Mike Escamilla, does anyone know Mike? Mike is a former professional BMX rider, he's a GoPro athlete, stuntman. Um, he was actually on a trip with me recently up to Alaska, and so we met there. And he also hosted a TV show called Stranger Danger, where he went around uh, around the world, basically. It's like the jackass of travel. And so he was doing everything from cleaning sewage in Mexico City to um, you know, mining for silver in Bolivia. So bringing together interesting people to hear stories, our mission and my mission truly is to encourage, inspire, and support travel. So if we can do that through talks, if we can do that through introducing people to cool people to hear their stories, as well as also give them some opportunities for some different travel discounts or uh, tell them about some cool places to go. I feel like we're doing our job. They really are great events. Thank, thanks, Mike. Uh, I've been to a few, as I said, and that's a new, a uh, bigger space now you're moving into. You're outgrowing uh, the one you're already in and moving into a, a, an even better, yeah, bigger we're space. We're changing it up a little bit. We yep. We're currently doing uh, the last several talks at a co-working space in Santa Monica. Um, Control Collective, if anyone's been there, has got a really cool back room. So we're going to give it a go and see what that's like. So what I love about having these two up here is, that, and they are very yogish and in, in, in alignment with the yog. You keep hearing this. I want it to burn into your brains. Yog, young older guy, young older gal, young older generation. Many, many uh, attributes to living up to the yog way of life. And travel is a very big part of that. And how many people want to travel and say they want to go to this country or the amount of people that say to me, oh, Australia, I've always wanted to go there. And then just go. <laughs> oh, and then, the, then come the conversations and the excuses. And so what I love about these talks, it really is inspiring. You come away from there and, and it's just like, I'm all right, I'm committed to go to this place I've always said I'm going to. And that is, for me, the best education is, is travel. So I love that we have that aspect here. These talks are inspiring. And we have the contribution and the giving. As busy as Nicole is, she still finds the time to give back. So hopefully that's inspiration for everyone. I know we have many of you, many if not all of you, up to similar things, which is why I brought you all together. And uh, the aim of YOG moving forward is to keep these going and find ways to collaborate. So many hands, right? Well, it'd be great to have a YOG with the bay. See? Like See? Uh, that's actually the reason I invited you. So anyway, let's... Uh, well, and, and I also just want to take the moment to just acknowledge what you've been up to, because I, I think the first one I've seen just the, the, the growth of the, the yard transformation uh, to where you are now. So just well done. Thank Keep you. going. It's fun to watch. Thanks, Thanks for having us. Guys. We'll, uh, Thank you. Thanks for having us.
Big round of applause for the young couple. Young couple. How is everyone? It, do you need a potty break, or are we good to, to get right, right going with the main portion of the evening? All right, good. Okay, so uh, the panel discussion for this evening. The idea, again, of these talks is that we have a theme, a different theme, that gives different value every time we get together and have one of these talks. And um, what is really great about putting these on in my position is going out and finding these amazing, influential, inspirational people and just how many people are so giving even though they are busy, they are a big deal and uh, they're still willing to give their time to a humble little event like this which is going to grow with your help but um, it's a real pleasure and, and an honour and I'm very humbled to have these two guests with us tonight. Uh, I won't introduce, I've, I've made again a little video that will showcase a little bit about these two. A little bit. Today's guest is Wendy Michelle, who is a consummate entrepreneur, health professional, wellness professional, biohacker. I'm not sure what Wendy doesn't do. It's really important for me when I'm giving advice to somebody else to at least have experienced it myself mm -hmm. or to be currently practicing, like we were just talking about, my daily routines. What does that look like? Um, and do I practice what I preach? In that sense, for me, I am constantly telling, um, I would say primarily women mm -hmm. who are you know powerful and and intelligent and and they can take care of things about how to be a girl mm -hmm. and how important it is to be taken care of and how important it is to to trust people and let people come in create a village a community um that stuff is just so important if you are pressed for time in the morning trainer and health coach and offer uh, author of effortless real food cookbook wendy michelle joins me so I feel like my approach is a little bit different because it's holistic. Okay. So a lot of people compartmentalize food, fitness, they right. forget about the emotional, the mental, the relational, the lifestyle. You're talking our language here at Emotional Mojo. What is insomnia? Well, that's a great question because it's pretty complicated and not all insomnia is created equal. Sleep deprivation signs can be everything from feeling fatigued, you can have big dark circles under your eyes, you can have bad skin, you can have memory problems. Dr. Bruce, there are millions of women, just like the women in our studio today, who are taking melatonin, and many of them experiencing the same side effects. Is that true? It is true. Welcome hey. to my bedroom. Thank you. It's pretty popular <laughs> in here. I haven't said that in a long time. <laughs> Dr. Bruce, what's going on here? She's the textbook case of what we would consider to be something like a sleep-related eating disorder. When we walk into a room, we want to have a sleep environment that's conducive to sleep. Relaxation. <laughs> what? Yeah, there you go. Oh, that's so what I can tell you is I've saved more marriages as a sleep specialist than I ever would have as a marital therapist. Yeah, I've had absolutely. the same pillow for at least 10 years. Yeah. That's just kind of gross. Is it? Yeah. <laughs> it is. A Please welcome to the stage. Dr. Michael Bruce and Wendy Michelle. Um, so if you don't, you can pass that between the two of you when I direct the question. So wonderful to have you two with us. It really is. And I mentioned the theme, today's theme. I thought it really just starts with who, who can I get out there that's big in certain industries and then let's form the theme around that. <laughs> so uh, when I met Dr. Bruce, literally in, a, in an elevator in the Playa Vista WeWork, I gave you my elevator pitch, <laughs> talked about yog and, and 
and straight away just he blew my mind when he was talking about uh, what he's up to and what he does. And then when I got home and actually really looked into what he does, I was obviously blown away um, with his knowledge, just on the spot, just the, the knowledge that you displayed and the enthusiasm you had for speaking to large audiences, small audiences, you just want to help people. I mean, Oprah, Dr. Oz, Rachel Ray, The View, and now Yog Talks, like, you've made it, man. <laughs> Congratulations. There was that one step I had to make, the Yog Talk, and now that I'm here, I'm Yep, go. you made it, you, uh, you qualify. Uh, and, and Wendy, well, again, we met the other day. Uh, we actually met through one of the first Yog speakers was Luke Story. He has a podcast called The Lifestylist. Ozzy Osbourne was on stage. That's right, Ozzy Osbourne. Stand up, Ozzy, please. Come on. <laughs> She's a, a, an original gangster Yog speaker. One of the only, well, the only female among four other males for Yog Talks number one. You were loving it. And... Uh, Luke's story has a podcast and when I was looking through because some amazing guests and I thought who could speak into this theme of the science of, of rest and recovery because we've been talking about relationships, we've been talking about emotional intelligence, mindset, well, let's, let's give the crowd some science, right? something you can really take home and apply and, and Wendy blew me away, her interview with Luke's story. So naturally, Luke connected the two of us. Then we sat down the other day at Bulletproof, of course, <laughs> Bulletproof Lab. She's a biohacker, among many, many other things, as you saw. And uh, again, it was two hours that felt like 10 minutes of just what comes out of this woman's mind and what's up there and everything that you're up to, and you just, you nonstop. There's no, there doesn't seem to be a limit to what you know and what you're willing to learn. And the funniest thing is when she's, she's talked about her retirement plan. Most people's retirement plan is to, I don't know, go to Florida and just sort of sit on the beach and play back, backgammon and do nothing or garden. No offense, I love gardening, uh, <laughs> Nicole. See you on the 17th. And uh, she's like, oh, I'm going to get a PhD in, in psychology, neuroscience, of course, neuroscience. So very impressive woman. Uh, that's my introduction, a uh, very informal one. I mean, I have a list of things that, uh, that, that qualification-wise, that Dr. Bruce has under his belt. I, I just, there's not enough time. I'm sorry, man. There's like three books. There's uh, How many books have you got, Wendy? For now. Thank you. I think we saw that one you were promoting up there. Um, well, let's just, let's just get straight into it because I want to ask a couple of questions to get us on the track, but I really want to hand it over to the audience. I'm sure a lot of you and some of you expressed to me personally, especially when it comes to sleep and quality of sleep, we're all affected by uh, lack of good quality sleep. I think to a certain degree, most of us have misconceptions about uh, what sleep is and how important it is for us and, uh, and our health. So let's let's start with um, let's start with Dr. Bruce. Um, Thank you. I mentioned there what what are this is an easy one. What are the three top three misconceptions people have about sleep? So first of all, I wanted to thank everybody for coming. Um, and thank you for having me at Yog. This is my first Yog meeting, but I feel as though I am a Yog yeah. for sure. Um, and I Don't be nervous. And I, I appreciate the fact that everybody's hearing made it out here uh, this evening. So thank you guys for coming. So when we, when we look at sleep in general and we look at misconceptions surrounding sleep, recovery, rest, all of these different areas, um, one of the first things that I tell people all the time is eight hours is a myth. Okay? So let's just get that out of the way straight away. Everybody's sleep need turns out to be different. So as an example, I go to bed somewhere between 12 and 12.15, 12.30 at night. I get up somewhere around 5.45, 6 o'clock in the morning. Okay? That puts me at about six hours of sleep. I'm the sleep doctor, for God's sakes, and I'm only getting six hours of sleep, right? So first of all, you all have permission to have, get the sleep that you need, right? And, there's, and that's, that can be different for different people, depending upon where you are from a health status perspective, where you are from a gender perspective, where you are from a age perspective. So the very first thing I like to let people know is there is no magic number, right? It's not about getting eight hours. Eight hours is something that the media has put into view, which is not necessarily true for everybody out there. I would say that's certainly one of the biggest misconceptions out there. 
Um, another misconception out there, um, I think, um, which is kind of a, an interesting one, it's always kind of humorous to me, is um, people like to look at food that can help with sleep, right? So we're kind of bringing us together here. And, and by the way, we just learned that we are actually colleagues and we have friends together and we have all this kind of neat stuff. So this was a great opportunity. So thank you for putting us together because now we've got all kinds of crazy ideas and fun stuff that we're going to do together, I'm sure. But one of the big things is turkey, right? So everybody's heard, right, that turkey makes you sleepy because of tryptophan? You'd have to eat a 26-pound turkey, okay, to be by yourself, right? E and on a, I mean, even in my days of college, on a good day, there's no way I could do something like that, right? So, and tryptophan doesn't work well in the presence of protein anyway, so that's another one of those things that kind of doesn't make sense out there, kind of a fun one, more food-related, of course. And then when you start to look overall, um, environment turns out to be one of the biggest factors that I work with people on to get better sleep. So one of the things we have to all understand is that the environment in which we create, our bedroom specifically, has to be conducive to sleep. Now, what does that mean? I am the only sleep specialist in the universe that says that it is okay to fall asleep with the television on. Yes, you heard it here. You heard it now. I fall asleep with, I personally fall asleep with the television on almost every single night. All right, now you're saying, oh my gosh, he's going against all, you know, known. Okay, so let me tell you the story and then I'll, I'll stop because I'm a storyteller. So when I met my wife, she said to me, by the way, Michael, I just want to let you know, I sleep with the television on. I said, oh, don't worry. I'm going to be a sleep doctor. I'm going to fix that for you, right? <laughs> How many people in here have ever tried to fix something in their partner? doesn't go over particularly well. Um, so let me tell you what happens in my house. So we have a king size bed. I'm here. My French bulldog is next to me. The chihuahua is next to him. My wife is here with the cat. There's a big screen TV and it's on almost all night long. Once again, I'm the sleep doctor. Okay. It's all about figuring out what works for you and adapting your lifestyle. Now, if you had that environment and it didn't work for you, well, then that's why you'd come to me and we'd talk about different things that you could do to change something like that. But at the end of the day, don't give yourself a hard time for what happens to work for you for sleep, unless it's drinking three bottles of wine before you go to bed, because there's a really big difference between going to sleep and passing out. Keep it. Oh, okay. Yeah. Really? Really. <laughs> So, the so when you look at alcohol and its effects on sleep, what we now know is alcohol, while it makes you feel sleepy, it prevents you from getting into stages three and four, which is deep, physically restorative sleep. During stages three and four is when your body produces growth hormone, and growth hormone turns out to be incredibly important for cell regeneration, right, and fixing all those insults and injuries that may have occurred to you during the daytime. Um, also, it causes massive dehydration. Right? So kind of like once you break the seal and you pee once, like you're peeing all night long, you have to be well hydrated in order to sleep well, and alcohol actually prevents something like that from going on. Half the reason that you have a hangover is because of dehydration. The other half is because of lack of deep sleep. I have another question. Um, I mean, you mentioned one of them was how can people, uh, what, what are ways that people can improve the quality of their sleep? You mentioned, you know, the bedroom environment. What, right. what other ways can help people get that quality sleep? Sure, so if you're looking to increase the quality of your sleep, I'm gonna give everybody in here something that they can do starting tonight and or tomorrow that I promise you will improve every single person in here's quality of sleep, and it's not too hard to do, right? So step number one is to keep a consistent wake-up time. Notice I didn't say bedtime, I said wake-up time. The more consistently you wake up at the same time, including the weekends, the better off your body is going to be. Because once your body knows what it's supposed to do, it gets there fairly quickly. The reason I only sleep six hours a night is because my bedtime is ridiculously consistent. And I've actually monitored myself while sleeping and I go almost immediately into deep sleep. Whereas many people, if they have a variable bedtime, that can change quite a bit. But the wake up time is when your body resets its circadian rhythm every single morning and that's critically important to your overall health. Second thing has to do with caffeine. I have no problems with people drinking caffeine, but you really want to stop by about 2 p.m. Reasoning behind this is caffeine has a half-life of between four and six hours, right? And so what we want to do is we want to make sure that at least half of that caffeine is out of your system before you get into bed. Now, I promise you there's somebody here who's going to be like, sleep doctor. He doesn't know what he's talking about. 
I can drink a cup of coffee with dinner or a cappuccino. But right, it's you right over here, right? Yep, there he is, <laughs> right? With, with the Starbucks in his hand, folks, right? And he's going to say to me, Michael, I can fall asleep immediately after having a cup of coffee or fairly close, right? Am I kind of close on that one? Yeah, so, so here's what's interesting is it turns out that people have different caffeine sensitivities, right? I know people who could eat a, a Hershey's Kiss and be up all night. I know other people who could drink, you know, four cappuccinos at dinner and then say that they're able to sleep well. It's not necessarily about can you fall asleep. It's about the quality of the sleep that you're getting. Bottom line, caffeine's a stimulant. There's no getting around that. And you can't actually get into those deeper stages of sleep with caffeine on board. So while you might fall asleep, the quality of that sleep can change. Step number three has to do with alcohol. It takes the average human body approximately one hour to digest one alcoholic beverage. So if you have two glasses of wine with dinner, maybe three, then you need to give yourself three hours to digest through that in order for you to be able to go to sleep and have good effective sleep. Step number four has to do with exercise. The single best way to improve the quality of your sleep is daily exercise. I'm not talking about running a marathon, okay? 20 minutes, walk the dog, park further away, walk to the store, whatever it happens to be for you, that will absolutely positively improve your sleep. And then the fifth one, which isn't so obvious, is get 15 minutes of sunlight every morning. Many people don't realize this because they think, oh my gosh, sunlight, that's bad for me, blah, blah, blah. 15 minutes is not going to kill you, number one. And number two, it helps reset that circadian clock. Also gives you a little bit of a dose of vitamin D. And we know that vitamin D can be extremely helpful for sleep. Got that, kids? <laughs> All right. Amazing stuff. Um, thank you. Sure. You crushing my caffeine <laughs> addiction. If you uh, just slow down by 2 p.m. or you get like maybe half calf or... Um, I don't know if you guys have ever tried that mushroom coffee for mm, yeah. sig, sig, sig something. Yeah. Sigmatic, Sigmatic. Thank you. That's that's kind of cool because it's got a reduction in caffeine in it, and it can be still be pretty good. Wonderful. Thank you. I'm going to ask Wendy a question because um, that was a great amount of information on our quality of sleep. Um, now, Wendy specializes, as I said, in, in many many areas, including recovery techniques for the waking hours. Yes. So, would you like to uh, enlighten us on some of the, the great techniques, some of the, well, the top three for you uh, techniques that we can employ for uh, our waking hours in, in terms of recovery and our health? Yeah, sure. Uh, so, sleep has been something that's always been a challenge for me. So, I've had to learn how to incorporate wakeful recovery and rest. Um, to make sure that I'm, you know, still effective and efficient all day long. Um, one of the things that I found to be very helpful for me, probably the most significant thing, is neurofeedback. Because a lot of what I do on a daily basis requires mental energy. So uh, some physical energy, but more so as of late, the mental energy. Um, so neurofeedback helps with resiliency, helps with mood, helps with sleep, helps with how you handle stress. And so that has been one of the most significant things that I've done. And because I have very little time, I have to find things <laughs> during the day that will just take a moment or a couple of moments that I can incorporate as time permits that will give me the, the largest amount on um, the return on my investment. So uh, neurofeedback is three times a week for 30 minutes, and I can still do emails and answer texts while I'm there. I'm not sure if that's recommended, but I still do it, and it's been very effective for me. Um, I also really love cryotherapy. Cryotherapy uh, for me was, is about, it's about three minutes, maybe a little less than three minutes, and there's no real prescription as far as how often one could go. But I do know that a lot of people have experienced improved sleep from cryotherapy as well. I mean, you're decreasing inflammation, um, and you are euphoric when you come out of there. You're um, invigorating the body. You're creating hormesis, so it's a, it's a slight stressor, so it's not chronic. Chronic stress is not recommended, but those little moments of stress where your body has to wake up and rise to the occasion, that always gives a good benefit. And then um, I also use HRV, so that's tracking um, where I'm at on a daily basis, heart rate variability. There are some really great ways to incorporate technology um, into the day, and that's one of them. It's a minute in the morning that tracks the um, heart rate variability. Um, and it gives me a little 
it looks like a, um, like a gas, like a gasoline gauge where it gives you a number based on that variability as to how recovered you are. So is that a day you should go run a marathon or is that a day that you need permission to rest? And I apparently need technology to tell me when it's time to rest. So that has been a very easy thing to incorporate and inexpensive and quick, that's one minute. So those are the ways that I incorporate recovery during waking hours and there's so many because it, it's, it's all relative to the career, to what it is that is driving you personally. So in some cases just 10 minutes of joy is exceptional in recovery and rest. Um, hanging out with your friends and having a meal is great for recovery. So it doesn't necessarily always have to be technology or some therapy that you have to go drive to make an appointment for. Sometimes it's just incorporating the simplicity of life and having those restful moments that will give you a huge boost of energy for the rest of the day and also help sleep when you actually can hit the pillow. I love the last thing you said. I mean, she could talk about the science, the neuroscience, go into chemical imbalances, go into all those scientific things that I, I know I don't, I don't understand. But she used one word, and that's joy. And how often do we just forget to incorporate that into our day? And mm -hmm. even just 10 minutes. Everyone here, we're go-getters, uh, so busy with our lives, and we get carried away, and we forget the simple things. And the next question I'm going to ask you, because you are a nutritionist, mm -hmm. and how important is food? You mentioned joy, those other great techniques of recovery. But what about food in the context of just recovering from our stressful, busy lives? It's vital. What you're feeding your body is, is vital. It's, it's an interesting thing because it, it's the one topic most people don't want to talk about. They have a lot of questions, but applying the advice is a whole other story. And yet when somebody gets very sick or when they experience a loved one being sick, the first thing they do is shift the diet. So it's almost as if we have this inner wisdom where we innately know that we need to adjust our dietary practices in order to accomplish um, you know, recovering from something serious like an illness. But it's always been very interesting to me how we wait for that to make the adjustment when we know that that's the first thing we'll do when this or that happens but yet in our daily life it's the easiest thing to apply so I think not only is it very important I think it is the easiest it's just become so overwhelming because of all the information out there when it comes to diet people are like oh I don't have time to I don't know what's the easiest thing for me to grab and yet it is the thing that will determine how quickly or how well we recover from whatever it is whether it's just a stressful day or an incredible workout or you know something more serious that's life life altering yeah uh i want to take this opportunity before moving on mm -hmm. you mentioned neurofeedback mm -hmm. everybody before you sat down you probably found a little card on your seat and if I not i have more she has more. <laughs> Have a look, and this isn't just a promotion or uh, an annoying little flyer. This is actually a gift for everybody from Wendy. And do you want to explain what everyone's holding in their hand? Sure. So um, th that's where I train. Also, Luke Story trains there. There's a whole bunch of, uh, of us that, that go to Peak Brain Institute. Dr. Andrew Hill is incredible. He was in one of the videos um, at the beginning of this. He is um, a wealth of knowledge, and he is very good at um, explaining it in a way that makes sense. So I'll let him be the expert on that. But in order to determine what is the best way to incorporate neurofeedback, that is a very individualized prescription that he would need to do and so he'll they will map your brain using QEEG and it's typically a very expensive test but he's offering it at a significantly discounted rate for everybody to be able to take a look to see what areas of the brain are most effective and which areas of the brains are potentially um, preventing you from accomplishing what you want to accomplish and, and it's not just for peak performers it's for people who have sleep issues, um, also have some depression, some anxiety, a lot of mental health and emotional health. And that was one of the most significant areas that helped me. I didn't realize that as I'm, you know, pushing through life and going and going and going and accomplishing and checking off all of the boxes that I had gotten to a point where I just kind of felt numb, where I couldn't necessarily feel joy, but I didn't know that I felt sad really either. 
and I was exploring neurofeedback just as a recommendation for my clients. Uh, I always want to see what's out there. I want to help people in every way. Whether I would adopt it or not is irrelevant to me. It's about knowing what there is. And so neurofeedback was one of the things that was very impactful for me in a way I didn't even expect. So I think it's something to at least look into and to, um, to explore. And I wanted to give everybody the opportunity to do that. So that's what those cards are. Thank you. Thank You're you. Welcome. Thank you, Wendy. Love the gift. Um, Dr. Michael. Uh, and this is a question I, I actually w would lo love both of you to speak into. With Yog, young older guy, young older gal, part of these uh, and the blog itself, um, the articles and discussions that we have, as we age, as we get older, uh, that's why one of the reasons why I started this concept was to, because obviously I was getting older, and all of us trying to stay younger. Physically, emotionally, mentally. And there's mindset, obviously, around that emotional intelligence. There's a language that you can control and you can change to accept the aging process. We all have challenges. We all have conversations around getting older and, and what it means to us. So scientifically, I'd love to hear from both of you with respects to your expertise, the importance of, uh, or the science behind and the implications of if you don't get enough sleep versus do getting enough sleep, um, food, everything you just discussed. If we want to stay, we want to put the why in yog, young, older guy and gal, what's some of the, the best ways and what are some of the, the damaging uh, things we can do to inhibit that? So as we get older, our brains change. Right? And so just like our bodies change, our brains change, and we actually don't get the same level of sleep that we got when we were 16 years old, 18 years old, 25 years old, things like that. And so believe it or not, the power of our brains begins to shrink over the course of time. We actually see this when we do something called EEG, which is when we measure people's brain waves. It turns out that the, as we get older, our brain waves don't actually elevate as high during that deep sleep that I was talking about, that physically restorative sleep. But that doesn't mean that we're not getting good sleep. It just means we're getting different sleep. And that's something that we all kind of have to adjust ourselves to. So as an example, it's pretty rare, even though I have seen pediatric patients historically, for me to get a lot of children who are having a hard time with the quality of their sleep, right? So how many people here by raise of hands have kids? Right, so I've got a 14-year-old and a 16-year-old, okay? I don't know if you remember when you were 14 or 16. You can sleep like the dead, right? <laughs> I mean, my son will stay up until about 12.30, 1 o'clock, maybe later on the weekends. He can sleep till noon, 2, 3 o'clock in the afternoon. There's no way I could do I can stay up as late as him. There's no way my body's going to allow me to, to sleep like that. So you have to kind of, again, think through what you used to be able to handle from a sleep deprivation standpoint to now kind of what might be more appropriate. Because I don't know about you guys, but if I stay out and up until 2 o'clock in the morning, I'm paying for it the next, I mean, drinking or not, I'm paying for it the next day because my body's still waking up at a fairly consistent time, you know, 5.56 a.m. So that's one of the things to kind of think through. The good news here, though, is, is that if you can keep, again, that level of consistency, your body will adapt and allow you to have significantly better sleep. For women in particular, it's really interesting. Very few sleep doctors will ever talk about this, but the truth of the matter is, is when you look at women and you look at their menstrual cycles, I've got, I've got women who I give different bedtimes based on where they are in their menstrual cycle because of how those hormones affect our sleep. Now you get, so I just turned 50 this year, and so I'm kind of looking at my life now, right, as a yog, and um, I'm like, holy crap, I'm on the back end of this thing now, right? <laughs> I mean, I, mean, I'm fit. I mean, how old can I get, right? So I'm thinking here, like, how, how can this be? What should I be doing? How should I be changing my life? What should I be doing for it? And so I'm doing a lot more nutrition-related aspects. And nutrition, by the way, is one of the key factors in getting a great night's sleep, right? Is if you do have clean nutrition, if you do have good nutrition, it will absolutely positively improve your sleep, especially as we're kind of creeping into those later years. For women, when we look at things like menopause, that has a huge effect 
on sleep because again, the hormone imbalance that's going on, things of that nature. So you really have to kind of think through those ideas and come up with an, a plan. You can't sleep like you used to sleep when you were 20 or 30 or even 40 in some cases. As you get older and older, you have to kind of adjust your sleep for your age. And it's not difficult to do, it's just a matter of kind of, again, keeping a couple of those factors in check, like I was talking about those five different things, caffeine, alcohol, consistency, sunlight, and exercise. If you can keep those in check, you will continue to have very high quality sleep as you get older. So, I like to use the analogy of, um, I used to be a risk manager right out of high school. I was a risk manager. So I would explain to people when they had damage to their property or damage to their vehicle, their options. Their options were to either get an original manufactured part to put on their car and make it like it was when they first bought it, or we can get the generic pieces and it will cost them significantly less. And a majority of the time, I'd say 99% of the time, they were appalled at the suggestion that we would put something different onto the car. Same with their homes, same with their fashion. I've just seen this throughout my whole life. And then when we start talking about food, people are constantly making this exception when it comes to diet. And yet the very thing that you're eating is the building blocks of your body. It's everything from, you know, how the signals are going to be given and received. It's everything from how your DNA is actually going to decide to unfold, whether this way or that way. And yet we're willing to take on um, generic versions of food. So as far as I'm concerned, the diet is the most important as far as aging is concerned. And this is whether you're a yog or even, you know, some of my clients have been as young as, you know, 12, 13, 14. I mean, every aspect of life, every season of life, we're building something. And, and as we're aging, things are starting to, you know, fray, kind of fall apart. And so you're giving them, and you're giving that, those areas of your body an opportunity to rebuild. And so choosing something that is the original manufactured part makes the most sense to me. And if we'll do it for our car, or we'll do it for our home, or we'll do it for our fashion, then why wouldn't we choose quality goods to put into our body? It will, it is the construction component of, of every aspect of who we are. So based on that, I think that it's the thing that we should be spending the most time on and looking at and considering when we're choosing what we're going to eat. It's going to determine how we age, whether or not we feel the aging process earlier or later. I've seen some people in their 20s who look like they're 20 years older than they are and, it all, and then we shift their diet and suddenly everybody's making comments about their skin and their hair and their um, muscular structure. It's pretty incredible what just diet will do and most people that I've trained as a personal trainer, I won't even go into the gym with them until we get the diet right. And then by the time we get that right, they don't even need me <laughs> anymore. So it's very, it's very important, I think. Great stuff. Can I just say, I love hearing you use the word yog, using that terminology. It just makes me feel so warm and fuzzy. That's what I want to do is get the yog out there. So everybody can be using yog from here on out. Let's make it a thing. I want to get it in the dictionary. So, um, I, you know, I'm weary of the time and, and I have respect for everybody's time here and I'm sure you have some burning questions. So, I'd love to hand it over now to the audience and here you have two wonderful brains at your disposal. So diet is very relative, and it's very unique to the individual for a lot of different reasons. And I know that the ideal answer to that would be much simpler, but I do think that a lot of factors have to be considered. So if I was going to generalize, I would say as close to nature as possible. Some, so choosing food that speaks the same language as your body that's been processed the least amount. So uh, also things that haven't been genetically modified. There is a lot of controversy on that. The jury is still out as to whether or not that will be an issue down the road. As far as I'm concerned, I'm not interested in building my body with something that the jury is out on. So um, 
it's just keep it simple. Back to uh, you know maybe what your great great grandparents were consuming is the easiest route for me to explain that without you know diving into the very specifics. I think that's also very unique. I think that oh, I think that it's um, it's more about the individual. Um, if there's any conditions, because if there's if there's certain conditions, digestive issues, meat might be an issue. Uh, if it, there's no conditions and they're just trying to choose something and there's no ethics involved, I mean, there's there's just so many elements. It's difficult to say. I don't personally have. I'm for people. So if meat works for you, then then source it in an ethical way and make sure that you're getting the closest to nature as you can. But if meat doesn't work for you, then let's find some vegetables and let's make sure you get proper building blocks through amino acids via plants. Does that make sense? Okay. Yeah. We're actually going to uh, we're going to give you the microphone too. Just so we can hear the question. And remember we're live, we're going out to millions of people out there, so make it nice and loud. Millions. I, I actually, a follow-up to what you were asking, how do you, what is your method of, I guess, how do you find out what works best for the individual? What is, do you, is there a test that one would take, or how do you determine? So there are different tests you can do. Again, with te technology and science is rapidly advancing. And a lot of it we're still figuring out along the way. So it's, it's, we can look at micronutrient levels and see if you know, there's some deficiencies in that way. But that's a more like deep dive. Just generally, I'm mostly concerned with the budget, the timeline, what will be sustainable for that person, what the household is eating. Because I can give the most in-depth scientific explanation about the best diet to eat, but if it doesn't work within the budget or the time constraints or the lifestyle or the family, then it's not sustainable and that information is just lost. So it's, it's more about checking in with the individual on that level and then going into probably hormones would be the next area of testing that I would look at and micronutrients as well to make sure that everything is firing on all cylinders. Uh, she had a question at the front here. Yeah, it was more around uh, brain health. Um, as we get older, we get brain fog. Can you talk a little bit about brain fog and what we can do about it? <laughs> sure. So I, I can talk about it from a morning brain fog perspective because I have a lot of patients and clients who, who have that go on. So one of the things that we know kind of contributes to that idea is melatonin. So if people are familiar, melatonin is kind of that key that starts the engine for sleep. Our brains produce melatonin. Believe it or not, 80% of our melatonin is actually produced in our gut, not necessarily in our brains, but the one for sleep is actually produced in our brain. And something called your chronotype turns out to be critically important. You may not know what the word chronotype means, but if you ever heard of somebody being called an early bird or a night owl, right? Those are chronotypes. So here's where it gets interesting, is if you're an early bird and you wake up at a particular time naturally, your personal melatonin shuts off, right? And then you have a lot less brain fog. However, if you're a night person like me, right, and you're forced to wake up at an earlier time when your brain is still producing that melatonin, it sucks, right? I mean, because you can't clear the cobwebs of that idea behind brain fog. Also, historically, when you look at somebody's sleep deprivation, however much sleep, what we call sleep debt, that a person has can definitely impact this idea of not thinking clearly, um, be, having a difficult time remembering words, things of that nature, which is kind of some characteristics that we see of brain fog. But it's also highly affected by nutrition. See, is that leading? <laughs> Boom. Yes, so from a nut nutrient standpoint, uh, a lot of times brain fog is, um, has to do with inflammation, has to do with your gut health. So that's the first thing I look at is how is the gut, what is the population, the diversity of the population in the gut. I go straight to the microbiome because majority of the brain fog will come from an unhealthy digestive system. Mm. Mm. And just to add on to that, the unhealthy digestive system is directly impacted by your sleep. 
right? And so this is, and that's one of the reasons it's great to have the two of us up here is because we're a, t we're a couple. I mean, not, we're not a couple, but we're a couple, <laughs> right? So all of our areas of expertise really interrelate quite a bit, and there's a lot of data now coming out on the microbiome in sleep. Your microbiome actually functions on a circadian pattern, right? So your microbiome goes up and down in a very um, prescribed particular way, and the more sleep deprived you are, the more it actually affects your microbiome. Um, this is for Dr. Michael. Uh, do you have any strategies or tips on, let's say you're following all the sleep hygiene routines, sure. whatnot, and you're in bed and you have trouble falling asleep. Right. So that specifically, and then maybe you wake up uh -huh. five, six a.m. whatever earlier yep. than you want. Yep. How to fall back asleep? Sure. So this is a classic. So first of all, that's a very great question because I get that question constantly. Okay. So for people who are having a hard time falling asleep, one of the first things I tell them is you're going to bed too early. Now that's gonna seem pretty counterintuitive right now. Like, what did he just say? Did he just say I'm going to bed too early? Here's what happens with people who don't sleep well, is they say, I've got the night off, somebody else is taking care of the kids, or I don't have any responsibilities, I'm gonna sneak into bed, right, at 7.30, 8 o'clock, because I'm gonna catch up on all that sleep that I've missed all, how many people by a raise of hands have ever Seriously, guys? Okay, good. So thank you, somebody out there, for helping me out. So what, in, what invariably happens is we get in, people get in bed too early, and because their circadian rhythm isn't ready to go to bed, their chronorhythm isn't ready to go to bed, what ends up happening is they stare at the ceiling, that, which causes anxiety, autonomic arousal, and then all of a sudden, they ain't falling asleep because they're thinking, I ain't falling asleep, right? 75% of sleep is between your ears. Okay, it has to do with your mental set when you get down and lie down into bed. If you think, oh crap, I'm not going to sleep, I guarantee you, you won't, right? That's just how that works. I tell people all the time, sleep is a lot like love. The less you look for it, the more it shows up, right? And, and that's very, very true in, in a lot of different ways. Falling asleep is, is, an, is usually an anxiety-related issue, or it's a timing issue, usually one of those two. Waking up in the middle of the night is, is kind of a different one, and I know you talked about waking up at the latter part of the night, but I want to address one issue that I have asked me constantly, which is, Michael, I wake up at 3.07 in the morning, and I have a hard time falling back asleep. What is that? Anybody in here experience that? Ah, so I got a few more hands that time. Okay, so one of the first questions that I ask people is when was your last meal? Totally. Okay, because here's the thing is people don't realize it, but when you're asleep, your body is not in park, right? Your brain is not in neutral when you're asleep. Believe it or not, your brain is in drive. If I showed you EEG waveforms during REM sleep versus wake, you can't tell the difference, okay? Your brain is consuming glucose at a very rapid pace during REM sleep, which means you need fuel. So a lot of people have their final meal at 6.30, 7 8 o'clock, and then guess what? 8 to 12 to 3, that's seven hours where your body hasn't had any food, doesn't have any fuel. And guess what? Your cortisol levels increase, which causes arousal, which makes you wake up at 3 o'clock in the morning. Super easy hack that I've used with patients. This is going to sound crazy, but it really does work is a teaspoon, not a tablespoon, a teaspoon of raw honey about 30 minutes before bed will actually keep your blood sugar levels pretty stable for a long time. I'm not saying this is the ultimate end all be all fix here, but I can tell you about 30, 35% of my patients who have this issue in the middle of the night, literally a teaspoon of raw honey fixes the whole thing, right? Now, then once I've kind of leveled that part out, and by the way, that's not great for people who have diabetes and things like that, so we can, we can talk about that offline, but once we kind of get that established, then we start looking at nutritionally, what are they getting in their last meal? And that's where, I, you know, Wendy's uh, data would come into play very nicely there, looking at are you giving yourself that opportunity to have enough blood sugar to kind of make it through the night? For people who wake up maybe an hour, hour and a half too early, that's probably your brain saying you're an early bird, right? And that might be okay. Absolutely not. Like, <laughs> not an early bird. That's just like sometimes you wake, I wake personally, wake up and I'm like, damn it. And then I go through exactly what you're talking and about. And that the anxiety monkey mind kind of yeah, hits. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so and it's hunger related. And you, it's hunger related. So, yeah. number one, you got to try the honey. Yeah. Um, there's also, believe it or not, there's actually a bar out there that's now been created called Night Food, believe it or mm -hmm. not. 
and it's specifically designed to give you enough carbohydrates to help you last throughout the night. So that can be something that can be that can actually work kind of well. Um, and what was the second part? Uh, waking up hungry. So some people actually have a metabolic issue going on there where you, we really want to take a look at, again, what are they eating before bed? Because that can have a pretty dramatic effect on our, our body's ability to maintain deep sleep. So if you're waking up in the middle of the night and you're hungry, one of the things that I have people do is I have them keep some crackers by their bed and just eat some crackers, have a little water, and go back to sleep. The easiest way to go back to sleep if you've woken up in the middle of the night, and most people don't know this fact, is your heart rate has to be at 60 or below in order to enter into a state of unconsciousness. 60 or below, all right? So here's what happens. Most people wake up and they think, well, I'm up. I guess I might as well go pee, right? Bad idea. Um, if you have to pee, I'm not saying if you have to pee, don't pee. <laughs> what I am saying is if you don't have to and you think, well, I'm up, I might as well, here's what happens. You go from a recumbent position to sitting to standing. Guess what? Your heart rate just shot up, right. and it went well above 60. Then you walk into the bathroom and you flip on the light. Well, you just told your brain it was morning because you got all this light that came in. It's a miracle if you actually get back to sleep at this point. So number one, if you don't have to go to the bathroom, if you can lie there and do deep diaphragmatic breathing, my favorite technique is the four, six, seven method. Breathing in for a count of four, hold it for a count of six, breathe out for a count of seven. That almost immediately starts to drop your heart rate, getting it closer to that 60 level, and that's when people have a tendency to be able to fall back asleep. Again, if you gotta go to the bathroom, obviously go to the bathroom. Do me a favor though, put a night light in your bathroom. So you go in, do what you need to do, go back out without flipping on that light, because as soon as you flip on that light, the sensors in your eyes say, melatonin, turn off, and then you got a real problem in your hands. Or actually, you could put on blue blocking glasses in the middle of the night. So I've got a friend in the back row back there who uh, makes these amazing blue blocking glasses, and that's one of the other things that you could do, is you could actually have blue blockers on, or as you're falling asleep at night, not get that blue light in. That's also gonna be an important factor. So you talked a little bit about, um, you know, what happens during the night. How do you feel about um, naps during the day? Mm -hmm. And then the second part of that is, you know, we talk a little about, about the night as well. During the day, you know, energy levels kind of go all over the place. Sure. What are the key things, both from kind of a holistic sense and as well as sleep, mm -hmm. that drive energy levels through the day? Sure. So I'm a big fan of naps. All right, I love them. Unless you have insomnia, that's the kind of the only caveat. If you're somebody that really struggles with falling asleep at night, there's data to show that the last time you were asleep directly affects how long it takes you to fall asleep. So if you took a nap at three o'clock in the afternoon, it might take you two to three times as long to fall asleep if you have insomnia than if the last time you were asleep was at 6.30 in the morning. But if you are hitting that kind of slowdown between one and three in the afternoon, there's nothing wrong with a nap. By the way, um, there's a very large part of the world that does nap at that time. It's called a siesta, and people have been doing it for like hundreds of years, right? So when you look at that from a biological standpoint, it's actually quite interesting. Right before you fall asleep in the evening, your core body temperature rises and then has a very small dip and then kind of plummets. That dip is a signal to your brain to release melatonin. Between 1 and 3 in the afternoon, there's a second dip. Most people don't know that, and that's actually from an evolutionary perspective and a biological perspective where the siesta actually came from. It actually has a biological underpinning to it. So if you are getting sleepy in the middle of the day, one of the easiest ways to avoid that, get some sunshine, right? Because melatonin doesn't process in the presence of light. So if you think that you're getting tired and you know consistently you get tired at, you know, 1.30, 2 o'clock, it has nothing to do with the pasta that you might have had for lunch. It has to do with this melatonin spike that's occurring. So go outside and get a sunshine break instead of a coffee break, and you might find it to be really helpful. And then another thing I want to tell everybody in here that I've used with almost every patient that I've ever had, like my CEOs, my Fortune 100 guys and gals, all that kind of stuff, I created this hack. I call it a Napa latte, all right? So here's what you do is you get a cup of black coffee, which has the hot drip coffee, which has the highest caffeine content, put three ice cubes in it to cool it down, slug it, then take a 25 minute nap. You don't want it to go over that because then you start to get into deep sleep. How many people in here by a raise of hands have ever taken a nap and felt worse, not better? It's because you nap too long. All right. So this is a foolproof way of doing it. If you set an alarm, drink your coffee, sleep for 20 minutes and set an alarm to wake up, 
you get enough stage one, stage two sleep to reduce that level of sleepiness, the caffeine kicks in, you're good for four hours, guaranteed. take these two questions here. I do I do want to just add to that if oh, I yeah. could really quick um, so if it's something that is is chronic so and and you because because taking a walk or getting active being out in the sun is the first thing that I typically recommend in the afternoon mostly because people aren't active at all uh, so it's potentially their first movement of the day um, and that t tends to help but if that's not helping if the napping is not helping then to me, it's um, looking at some systems of the body, so your endocrine system, making sure that you, there's not like some adrenal fatigue or, you know, there, you may have been pushing yourself for years and it's finally catching up to where there is no relief in the afternoon, but you can support that with herbs and diet as well. So that would be the next thing that I would look into if those things don't, don't work because that would be my number one recommendation as well. Can you talk about sleep and meditation? Oh, sure. So this is a great topic, looking at uh, sleep and meditation. And so there's a lot of different schools of thought out there. And, it, and some of it actually depends upon the type of meditation that you do, right? So I've got clients who have been doing TM for 15 years. Believe it or not, they need less sleep, right? Because their body is getting from that. I mean, I don't know if you guys know it, transcendental meditation, like it's serious, hardcore. Like you got to know what you're doing to be able to do this stuff. But the people who know how to do it, it's amazing how it affects their lives and does some really super cool stuff. So some of those people actually require less sleep. Generally speaking, what I have a lot of my patients do from a meditation standpoint is I have them doing meditation about 15 to 20 minutes before lights out. From the standpoint of that type of meditation that I'm having them do, which is usually progressive muscle relaxation, guided imagery, helps relax them and lower that level of anxiety so that their natural sleep deprivation can take over. Whereas there's some meditations, as I'm sure you're aware, that can be more energy promoting. Right? And so you have to be careful the type of meditation that you might be doing in the evenings because that can have a pretty big effect on your ability to fall asleep or, or not fall asleep. Did that help answer? Very much so. Okay. I, I teach TM, by the way. Oh, well, see, there you go. I had no idea. TM's cool stuff, man. Dr. Bruce, um, as I understand it, 65 to 69 degrees Fahrenheit is yep. the cool temperature that we want to sleep in for optimus, optimal sleep. Right. Um, However, a lot of people say uh, a warm or a hot bath at the end of mm -hmm. the, the night helps them sleep. Sure. But isn't that raising the core body temperature, which would then contradict that um, sleeping in a cool environment? So this is a great question. Thank you, James. And by the way, this is the guy that makes those amazing blue blocker glasses. This is my friend James. He's awesome. Good check. Talk to him after the, after the meeting. So when we look at... Um, the recommendation of having a hot bath or shower before bed, what it does is it does elevate the core body temperature. It's the subsequent drop in core body temperature that happens within 20 to 30 minutes after the hot bath that actually signals the brain to release melatonin. So yes, we want a cool environment to sleep in, but sometimes warming our body up first and then allowing it to cool almost artificially can actually be very, very helpful for some people. Um, also, by the way, I don't know anybody out here who has this situation occur, but when it's really warm, how many people, again, by a raise of hands, take their foot and they stick it out of the covers and instantly they cool down, right? So I've been asked this question a million times, so I had to look it up and figure out what's going on. So it turns out that the skin on the bottom of your feet has no hair, so it's not insulated. So it's actually the skin that can actually release heat the best. And so one of the ways, if you and your bed partner have different... Um, temperature uh, wants or needs. One person can sleep with their feet out of the covers. The other person can sleep with their feet under the covers. And a lot of times you can accomplish a peace treaty on the air conditioner or the electric blanket. Just a follow-up question on core body temperature. I've read yeah. studies that suggest that morning exercise is superior for sleep than evening exercise because evening exercise raises that core body temperature. Is that your understanding? Well? So it's interesting when you look at exercise uh, getting fairly close to bedtime. My general recommendation is you don't want to exercise roughly four hours before lights out because of this elevation in core body temperature that can occur. But one of the things I have found, so when I was in graduate school, um, I'm a runner, and when I was in graduate school and I'd be teaching class all day and running sleep subjects you know, in the early evenings, I didn't get a chance to run until 10 o'clock at night. Right? And I would go for my run at 10 o'clock at night, and I would hit the bed, and like a stone, I would be gone. And what I discovered was is there are some people 
who get relaxation from physical exertion. And there are some people who get energy from that. You'll figure ki out kind of which one of those people you are, and then you can kind of follow that guideline. So again, there's not a hard and fast rule that says don't exercise before bed, but if, if exercise has a tendency to give you more energy, it's probably, you're probably gonna be better off doing it earlier in the day. If you look at it from a performance standpoint, like let's say you're training for a race or a, you know, a Tough Mudder or a Spartan Run or whatever the CrossFit thing is that you're doing these days, um, it turns out that exercising earlier in the morning, not too early, but like maybe within two hours of waking up, turns out to be better because you need to allow your body to warm up before you start doing something strenuous. So you gotta be a little bit careful. You don't wanna like get up, throw on your running gear and hit the trail because a lot of times that's when injuries occur because your body, you haven't stretched well and your body isn't ready to kind of do that level of physical exertion. Good question. Thank James. you. Saturday, by the way. Thank you. Thanks. Oh. <laughs> you guys don't care. It's cool. Um, <laughs> so I worked nights <laughs> for five and a half years. Yep. Um, but that was, I ended in 2012. Okay. And I understand that that did a huge number on my body. I have digestive issues. Um, so trying to figure out... Um, How long, so I did that for five years, how long does it take your body to readjust to, like, to recover from that sort of damage, basically? Sure, sure. Actually, we can probably both tag team this one. Um, so when you look at people who are shift workers, right, who work the night shift, if I may ask, what, what kind of job were you doing? Um, I, <laughs> super stressful. I worked at a drug rehab. <laughs> Okay, so you were the night you were this you were the graveyard shift. Yeah, I worked twelve. Uh, twelve to tw twelve. Twelve to eleven to eleven. To, okay, eleven to eleven. Like right. Yeah. So for folks out there that are shift workers who've had to work that shift, so the data is super clear. It's about the worst thing you can do to your body, right? I mean, unless you're an extreme, uh, what I call a wolf or a night owl, where you're naturally staying up until four or five o'clock in the morning. That's great for those people, but ninety-five or actually eighty-five percent of us are not that person, um, it definitely can have a long-term effect. What I've discovered is it depends upon the length of time that you were working that shift as to how long your body would just kind of naturally fall back into place. What I do with a lot of my patients is I actually have a protocol where I actually work with them. I'm not gonna wait for your body to naturally adjust. I'm gonna push your body to adjust. And that has to do again with consistency of your bedtime, also getting light very early in the morning to again help your body get used to that idea. I can usually swing somebody back in somewhere between 30 and 45 days um, of a very regimented, go to bed at this time, wake up at this time, get light, and I actually use melatonin as a supplementation, and that can be very helpful as well. So I've, I've had that experience as well, but also a lot of it has to do with your food and your timing of your food intake, mm -hmm. right? Because remember, your, your second brain is your gut. Right? And a lot of what goes on in our body has to do with when we intake food. And so also maintaining a level of consistency of food intake can actually be really important in that as well. Because when you're working a shift, right, your lunch is like at 2 o'clock in the morning. Right? And, and that messes with your gut yeah. quite a bit. So definitely thinking through the idea of timing of food and then what you eat can actually have a pretty big impact. So the gut actually is something that is relatively, at least in my experience, something that would be similar, whether it's a specific protocol to to retrain that aspect as far as you know the eating and the timing and so on. But what I've found a lot of people who have had that experience, who have um, gut issues, but also were working through the night, a lot of it is also emotional and mental work. So it's creating, um, I guess the simplest thing would be giving yourself permission to adjust to a new schedule and having that mindset. Because a lot of times the thought is, this is how it's been, this is how my stomach works, this is when I eat, this is when I go to sleep, and now it's different. And just that thought process is perpetuating the pattern. And so sometimes it's also just shifting mindset and saying, okay, this is now the schedule, this, and I have permission to eat at this time, and this is okay for me, and this is good for me, and, and, and instead of discussing what it used to be, um, turning that into what it is now, and making that part of the process. And that's 
overly simplistic, but at the same time, perception is very powerful. So give yourself permission to adjust to a new schedule. I would also just add to that that when you look at, sorry, thank you. When you, when you kind of look at the types of foods that you're eating, that can actually have an influence as well. Um, and sh look, shift workers, if you look at the data, they're the sickest people there are. They have the most mental health issues. They have the highest suicide rates. Like, I mean, the data is out there and it's very, very consistent, right? Working a shift is not good for your body, period, end of story. There's lots of people out there that do it, right? And why? Time and a half or double time when you're working a shift, you make a lot of money. Right? Great job for an actor at the time. <laughs> right, right, exactly, right, is I'm doing auditions during the Except day. Except I wasn't getting enough sleep in general because right. I would then leave work and then right. go to an audition or two or three and then come home and then try to sleep. Right, and so, and so like looking at just, just what you described to me right there is a disaster yeah. when it comes to your sleep, right? And it affects your ability to act, to emote, to do all of those things that you wanted to do as well as watching, you know, people in rehab all night long. So, I mean, there's a lot of different ways that you can start to get better habits over the course of time. Happy to talk with you afterwards if yeah. you'd like um, to kind of learn a little bit, little bit more about that for sure. Um, thanks, Amy. W wonderful questions, everybody. Thank you so much. Got a lot of information from these wonderful minds up here. Again, conscious of the time, and uh, I can see us getting a little restless. I want to wrap things up. I'm going to ask uh, a question to each of you uh, before wrapping up. Then we have the raffle that hopefully everybody put their name and an email address, and uh, we're going to draw that out in a little bit. And no, if you if you didn't. Um, it's coming out now. Make sure you do because we have some great prizes. Uh, but before we do, so part of this community and, and what we're encouraging here at YOG Talks and in general is support for one another. So these networking events are meant to bring you together to connect, to be inspired, which I'm sure you'll agree we all have been tonight, and, but also support one another. In, in this process. It's the most important thing, um, is, is achieving win-win for everybody out there. So my question to both of you uh, is how can we, as the YOG community, YOGs and YOGettes, support you? Let's start with you, Wendy. So the work that I'm doing right now is in the food industry, and it's a huge project, because that is the one area that is the the hardest to push in a specific direction, and the direction I'm trying to push it is into the, the benefit of the consumer. So what would be most helpful for me is to be, to continue to be, because I believe everybody in this room is educated consumers, um, and to continue to um, insist on truth in marketing, and to make sure that there is um, transparency in labels and making sure that companies and corporations are being held accountable for their contribution to people's health. Because healthcare starts in the grocery store, as far as I'm concerned. And if we're not being bold as consumers or insisting that that shift, then that makes what I'm trying to do that much harder. <laughs> so that would be very supportive of, of what I'm trying to work on. I ha will have products coming out. I have several launches coming up in the next couple months. So if you follow me on social media, you know, I can point you in the direction of those. There's a product um, about a month away, so I'm excited about that. Um, and then also what's very supportive is just uh, continuing to, to learn and to be part of community with each other and to love each other really well. That helps me a ton because then as people feel their significance, their contribution to the community, then they're more likely to be those demanding, bold consumers. And that's what it's going to take to move the food industry in the direction in which we don't have to be private investigators when we go to the grocery store. That was awesome. Um, I'm always up for, I, I like doing these like, I like to have, like, look, I talk in front of, you know, audiences that are 1, 2, 10, 15,000 people at a time. And to be honest with you, that's cool and great. It's not as much fun as this kind of environment. So if people out there have opportunities uh, where I can come and educate, I'm all for that. Because I feel like I really can have that 
one-on-one, -on -one, answer those questions. When I'm in front of a thousand people, yeah, I can answer a couple of questions, but it does, it's not intimate. I can't really get involved. And that's really what I like to do. Standing up on a stage is fine, but at the end of the day, I love answering questions and I like educating people about sleep. Um, you know, the, I think the, the data would suggest that you can go for three days without water, you can go for something like 20 days without food, you can go for about nine days without sleep, right? And so I don't want anybody out there going nine days. <laughs> Um, especially if they're driving a vehicle in this particular area. So I, I just want to have the opportunity to educate more and more people. Um, that's kind of been my passion since I've been doing this. So um, feel free to connect with me. Um, I do have a new book out called The Power of When. It's all about chronotypes. Um, the website is thepowerofwhen.com. Um, my website is The Sleep Doctor. So follow me, check it out. I always have great blogs, lots of good information. And uh, if I can be of service, please let me know. Wonderful. Excellent. Well, uh, that concludes the panel discussion for the evening. We're going to have the... Uh, let's have a round of applause. Yeah, let's do that. Thank you, thank you. Well, don't go anywhere um, because you have a prize that you're going to uh, explain. You're donating. Let's make it the number one, the first prize, the first cab out off the rank. So if we can have... We have the beautiful Kristen coming down with everybody's entries. And can we have Amy as well? Just before we draw, Amy, can you come down? So I think you noticed when you walked into registration and you got yourself a drink or some dip and you signed in. This is my official support crew for the night and I want everybody to give a great round of applause. Oh, well, yeah, yeah. Just hang by. Um, you don't understand how <laughs> I need this. You, you can see how frantic I am when you come in, guys. And I'm like, hey, great to see you. And then I'm sort of like edging somewhere else. Without these ladies, I really, I would have lost my shit. So thank you. Um, now, without any further ado, we have everybody. Has everybody put their name in there? Don't miss out. Rob, all right, you've got you got one minute. Okay, yeah, let's have a question from handsome. Thank you, handsome Rob. Not a yog yet, by the way. He's a yog in training. Uh, I want to know if yawning is contagious. Sure. So the question was, is yawning contagious? So the actual answer is yes, it is. Um, and believe it or not, it's not. It's contagious primarily with mammals. Um, so if a lion yawns, other lions will yawn. Just like if a human yawns, other humans will yawn. We don't 100% know the reason why we yawn, but there's a couple of theories out there. The biggest one is it's a temperature regulation mechanism. So what's happening is your brain is getting too warm, and when you <gasps> take in a big breath of air, it's not 98.6 degrees. It's whatever the temperature is that's outside, and it actually helps cool your mouth down, which actually can help cool your brain down. So that's one of the theories of yawning. yawning why we yawn. It's actually a temperature regulation. Actually, we don't know what happens exactly when a lion yawns because nobody wants to get in there, right? But we do know that almost all creatures that are mammals do yawn. Absolutely. All right. Okay. I love it. Oh, Fire away, man. One more question from Tim. So this one's for Wendy. Uh, any tips nutritionally on a person trying to cut sugar out and dealing with of just of a general day when you're used to having a soda in the middle of the day or something like that? Any, uh, the question was, any tips to cut out sugar from the diet? So out of the gate, if, it's, if you're going from having sugar regularly to just cutting it like out, is that what you mean, like the first couple of days? So uh, one, planning the time to do that would be um, when you're not, there's not a huge demand on your schedule or on your time or... You're not, you know, hanging out with a bunch of family and friends that you're going to try to get along with. You don't want to do it on those days. So days where if you feel a little tired, you'll, you will feel fatigue from that. I mean, your body's shifting its energy source. So timing, planning would be the number one. Um, another one would be um, in some cases it helps some to utilize exogenous ketones. There's a lot of products out there. I don't recommend them ongoing, but it does help a little bit with shifting the energy. 
um, into more of a ketone type energy fuel source that does help maybe the first two, three, four days. As far as cravings are concerned, those things will go away over time. But, it, you know, plants like stevia, I love stevia plant. Like if you can get the actual plant in your home and just have it growing nearby and throw that in with your coffee, throw it into your smoothies. It's natural, so it's not going to provoke the types of cravings that an unnatural sugar is going to, but you'll still get a little bit of that sweetness. So that, that will help as well. And then you can get stevia from the store. It's a, it's a little bitter, so there's some tricks to it, but let me know. I can help you out with those. Thank you, Tim. Okay. So the grand prize straight off the bat. Uh, Wendy, Michelle, please explain this amazing prize that you've kindly donated to all the folk out here. Sure. So this is uh, going to be for a personal precision health nutrition consultation with me where I will take in all of the data and information about your personal lifestyle, what it is that you're trying to accomplish from a mental, emotional, and physical standpoint. We're going to design a meal plan, and then we're going to go grocery shopping together, and I'll teach you all about labels, how to make sure that you're not um, getting marketed to too much, and that you're making the most use of your money when you're shopping for your food. Wow. Kristen. It's really bring fun. Bring it up. And uh, Wendy, can you please reach in? So if it says Christian, just put it back in. <laughs> Reagan? <Yeah>. Reagan. <laughs> Stand up. Congratulations. Okay, so can you two can connect. Yes, of I course. Need, so we, I'm going to keep that yes. because I need your email. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, next from GT's Kombucha is a case of kombucha. Maddie, you've still got to pick yours up from two weeks ago. I brought it for you. Where are you? Okay, good. Don't leave without it. So, um, Dr. Bruce, can you pick out the lucky winner of the kombucha? Uh, I don't have my glasses, so you're okay. going to have to read it for me. Swanee, is that you, James? Yeah, it is. Yeah, yep. James. Kombucha for the Aussie over there. Well done. All right. See me. Thank you. Now, Yog T-shirt. You've seen them hanging up there, I'm sure, when you came in. They are now for sale, right? <laughs> Yes, they, they, yes, yes. Feel the fabric, put your face up to it, and, uh, and then you can purchase if you don't win this prize right now. Come on over, Kristen. I'm going to do this one. Rejoy. We have a woman winner, and there will be some ladies' uh, styles and sizes coming out in the, in the, for the next one. So congratulations. You can hold on till I get the next... Yeah, batch, or you can take one of those. See me afterwards. Well done. Round of applause, everyone. It's a, it's a Yog t-shirt. Come on. Okay. Now, to wrap up quickly, this is my favorite part of the evening. I've already had, I'm opening it up now. There's so many more names in there of worthy winners that did not win one of those three prizes. So if you have something to donate that you'd like to contribute to the community in this space right now and promote yourself in the meantime... Now's your time. We have Ken Dapper, the resident photographer. You'll get his amazing photos from the evening via a newsletter. What are you exactly um, offering, Ken? Um, everybody needs that. So do you want to draw it out? Sure. Come on. So for a session with Ken Dapper, yes, Dapper, the Yog. I should have done that for you. Noel, congratulations. <laughs> Connect you two. I'm keeping this. All right. Um, Amber J, please tell us what you got for us. Put the drink down. <laughs> ah, hi, everybody. Thank you. I receive. <laughs> and that's exactly what we're doing in the goddess process. So it's a 30-day program of manifesting from the feminine, so goal setting from the feminine. It's a coven of women coming together to support each other and manifest what they deserve in their lives. And so I, the next 
session starts on August 24th, which is my birthday. And um, I am giving away one session, which is a value of $198, which in Chinese is everlasting abundance. Ah, and it's got to be a lady. So all you dudes, sorry, bitches. Kendra Banks. Kendra. Oh, she gets to go. Thank you, Amber J. Connect you to, can I have that name, please, Kendra? I might have your email address. Okay. All right, we have some hands up. Yes, what do we have here? Let's, let's. Two, buy one, get one free from Carver. And uh, Kristen, yeah. may, uh, may I choose Rickon? Where he just went in the back. Rickon, congrats. Come and get it. Well done, Rickon. All right, Carver. I see you wolfing that Carver down as well. You're going to love this. I'm going to put it there. Okay, hands up. We have Swanee and we have. Barrett over there? Yes. All right. Let's move through this because everyone's ready to uh, connect. Uh, so I'm going to give away a sleep kit from my sleep company, Swanwick Sleep, a pair of these blue light blocking glasses, uh, a 100% pure silk sleeping mask, and an all-natural sleep supplement. Uh... Sharon? Did I say that, Sharon? Congrats. Go and connect with your, your new prize and your prize giver. Thank you, Swanee. How, how do we... How do we uh, this is per I mean, this is all perfect. Do you understand? Swanee, uh, how do we follow you? How can we, uh, how can we follow you on the, on the interwebs? At uh, Swanwick Sleep. Okay. You've all got your phones out, so at Swanwick Sleep. Thank you. Well done. Who's next? Yes. Christine? I have tried. I've tried them and loving them still. Fantastic. And you have six to give away. She's got, oh, how handy is this? Okay, Kristen, pick one out. Kaylee Anderson. Well done. She comes to nearly every one of these, so you deserve the tea and more. Well done, Kaylee. Got that, Christine? Okay, we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna take two more. Oh, the tonight is photography night. Rob King, stand up. King Roberto. All right, sit down. <laughs> I have a print of, uh, it's like printed on acrylic. It's a waterfall in Iceland, so... It's huge, but it's really cool, so anybody who wins can have it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah you need a big wall, but it looks good. Dig it out. Uh, everyone on your phones, King Roberto on Instagram, check out his stuff. No, seriously, right now. Robin. That would be Robin. It's Robin Ryan McDonald. Robin. She was here. What do we... Do about that. I mean, I know. Well, do we redraw? Are you sure she? You have to be present. Ouch. Okay. Does. Yep. <laughs> Shame, Robin. Oh, okay. Well done. No. Congratulations. Take it. Oh, well done. Receive, Kristen Compton. Well done. All right, connect you too. Uh, did I say two more? Okay. Wait, you've been waiting to... No, didn't you already? Oh, you didn't? Okay, quickly, two more. Uh, my name is Barrett. I'm a meditation teacher, and every Tuesday night I host an event called Dating and Meditating where we, have a, we do a group meditation, and then we discuss a relationship topic, and we always give the women in the room the floor first so that we can fill the room with a feminine perspective. The tickets to Dating and Meditating are $22, and I'm offering four tickets to the lovely winner of this event. That's me. <laughs> 
I'll already be there. Yeah, I picked myself. I'll already be there. Yeah. Ozzy Osbourne. Who, by the way, is a relationship coach. So pick me, pick me, pick me. Thank you, Barrett. Uh, last one. What is it? So I do uh, an Airbnb experience in uh, Venice, and I take you on a tour of uh, the Venice Street Gardens and coffee, and you get to meet some of my farmers, and if you want, you can meet the kids or whatever you prefer, or we can go to your house and I can maybe do an assessment of what you want to grow because, as we know, we want to get back to nature and take care of our guts. So. Two. Which one? Wow. Okay. Uh, <laughs> hey, no, I, cho- I got this one. You said choose, right? He was about to choose for me. Uh, Jeff Johnson. Yeah. Hey. yeah. All, right. All right. Connect afterwards. Okay, 9.30, guys. Thank you so much for your patience. A long time sitting. Once again, a round of applause for our two amazing yeah. guest speakers. Follow them. Uh, you'll be getting newsletters. And hang around and connect. I assume you'll be, yep, you'll be staying around, get some photos um, and connect with one another. We've got the space for a little while. Otherwise, I will see you at Yog Talks number five. Thank you so much for coming, guys. And tell people. Thank you.